it's a privilege once again to meet this morning uh, and to continue to learn of God's ways. I remember a conversation that I had with a person many years back. Uh, this person was interested in our fellowship. Uh, he wanted to know a little bit more about the church, our belief system, uh, certainly about our history, uh, when we were founded, what our, you know, our doctrinal beliefs were. And as I discussed each one of those, I also showed him that we were, you know, in, in, at that particular time, uh, that we were not necessarily charismatic. Uh, we were not, you know, aligned to any particular large denomination. And as he heard me, he decided to declare right uh, on my face. He said, uh, I think you are not a Christian. And uh, I was obviously taken aback and uh, a bit shocked. And I ventured to ask him, why do you think we are not Christian? And he went on to say, because you don't speak in tongues. So uh, his understanding was that every Christian must speak in tongues. And of course, the conversation was cut short. I never saw him again because I don't think he ever wanted to fellowship with us because of his thinking that we were not Christian. And, I, and as I was reflecting on that, I was just thinking, I got a bit of my own medicine actually, you know, because most of us remember that in uh, our pre-Reformation days, that we used to have very strong beliefs and we used to be, I would say, very fault-finding of others. And uh, here I was being found fault with by someone who thought that I was not a Christian. I still remember that we used to be so strong on uh, declaring people that they don't believe in Jesus because they did not believe in the three days and the three nights theory. Now, most of our senior members will remember that we very strongly taught that Jesus had to be buried in the grave for three days and three nights. And we went on to say that if you don't believe that, you are worshiping a false Jesus. That's the extent with which we used to be so judgmental. And uh, thinking about it now, I feel embarrassed in the sense that I, I feel sorry that we condemned people on the basis of a mathematical calculation. <laughs> uh, I was, I was just wondering, since when did salvation was dependent on understanding a perfect mathematical perspective, 72 hours? <laughs> uh, and so, having said that, I'd like to ask the question today for all of us, even as we uh, come to the table at the end of uh, the sermon, to partake of the Lord's Supper. Let me ask this question. Is it right to judge people about their Christianity on the basis of a practice uh, that we might have or we might not have? Is it right to condemn them? Think of them as inferior or think of them as not part of the faith just because they may not do some things are uh, exactly the same way we do it. Do we condemn people as false Christians? And unfortunately, I confess that we were in a position or we were in a framework of mind that did that in the past. Thankfully, God brought us out of it. And he brought the reformation into the church. Now, you know, the apostle Paul knew that many Christians would struggle with such attitudes. And sadly so that even today, 2000 years or so later, 
we are still struggling with similar attitudes where we tend to judge people, we tend to find fault. And so the Apostle Paul decided to dedicate an entire chapter and actually Romans chapter 14 that was read to us and on into the 15, he discusses this aspect of us as Christians. Um, so this is what I want to discuss this morning. How should we treat those who might differ from us in certain practices? And so I'll just go ahead and share my screen at this time uh, and give you the, if uh, Praveen can help, uh, let me share my screen. I have titled uh, this uh, sermon, Living Gracefully. Let me see if I can just widen that a bit. Okay. Right. Um, I think, uh, can you see the screen? I, I, I presume you can. Sachin, are you okay with the screen? Can you try again? Yeah. It's come? Okay, right. It looks like my network is a bit slow. So the title of this, this uh, sermon today is Living Gracefully. And obviously you might recognize why I titled it that way. Because the question we have to ask is, do we have grace in the way we treat others? And in fact, we are also going in our Bible study, we are discussing about Christian behavior. And I thought it would match very well as we discuss this today. So let's look at Romans 14 and pick up some of those verses that uh, was read to us in, in verse one. It begins by saying, the Apostle Paul writes, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now, it's interesting, he uses uh, a phrase there. He says, stop quarreling over disputable matters. What are disputable matters? Obviously, uh, to put it in a very simple way, it is matters that may be important for some of, for some and may not be as important for others. You see, why is it disputable? Because we are never able to arrive at a consensus. We are never able to say biblically that this is right or that is wrong. For some reason, there is some ambiguity in uh, certain matters. The Bible is not very clear about certain things. Uh, it could be partly right, it could be partly wrong, both could be wrong, both could be right. So these are aspects that we struggle with. And what we need to understand is the Bible is silent uh, or it does not give in enough information about certain, uh, some of these matters the text may not be clear. So that is the reason why they are, as it was mentioned by, uh, by the Apostle Paul, as disputable matters. Now, what, are, what were these disputable matters uh, in the church at Rome at that particular point in time? And so let's look at just a few thoughts there. One is, eating vegetables, you see, uh, there seemed to be a controversy about uh, vegetarianism. Uh, should you be vegetarian or should you be non-vegetarian? Maybe some of them were very upset over the fact that uh, they didn't want to eat meats because they were afraid it may have been offered to an idol. For whatever the reason, some people became vegetarian and uh, there were you know, debates about it, and unfortunately, there were judgmental, judgmental attitudes about it. Another problem that was being faced by the brethren was what day to worship, what day to keep as holy. You know, some people consider one day as holy, somebody else considers somebody, something else as holy. 
uh, you, if you, you know, through historical research, we know that the church in Rome had both people from a Jewish background and also from a non-Jewish background or from a Gentile background. And so the Jewish people probably had more affinity to a particular day. And the Sabbath day was something which was very important for them. So there was a fight over which day would be more sacred than others, which day would be the right day to worship. And of course, there was one more problem. And it, as it says in verse 21, drinking wine was another issue that uh, some people struggled with. Uh, is it okay to drink wine? Is it okay not to, you know, I mean, some people had some big problems with it. And of course, <laughs> even today, I think there is a debate on this. Uh, there is a, a joke, which I'm not sure if you remember, but there was a pastor who preached against drinking wine. And this particular pastor, you know, was dead against wine. And he said, it is wrong to, you know, and sinful to drink wine. And he tried to make it very dramatic. In one of his sermons, he took a glass of, uh, I think it was whiskey, and he took a live worm, you know, an earthworm. And he dropped the earthworm into the glass of whiskey. And the pastor, and of course, the, the earthworm begins to wriggle and it dies. And the pastor comes out and says, who can tell me what does this mean? He wanted to make it, you know, very graphic. And he says, who is the one who can tell me what this means? And so an older man put his hands up and, uh, and he said, Pastor, this means if you drink wine, you will have no worms. <laughs> and so uh, there goes the joke. And of course, unfortunately, there is still a lot of, uh, you know, debate over this. So uh, what does Paul tell about these disputable matters? Okay, how does Paul look at it? So let's just look at uh, how Paul concludes uh, in this, in this uh, chapter. Um, he says, accept the one whose faith is weak. Now the word weak, could be someone maybe who see, th see things differently. Maybe he's referring to somebody who may not be as mature in the faith, uh, maybe still struggling with the elementary aspects of the faith because he also contrasts weak with strong. If you see, I'm not going to go there, but Romans 15 verse one, he says, we who are strong. So he can contrast weak with strong and maybe he's meaning that those who are strong maybe can exercise a certain liberty in their faith. Uh, maybe they see, you know, love as more important uh, rather than some of these issues. And so for the strong, which day and what foods to eat and whether there are tongues, speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues, these were not something that was central to the Christian faith. All right. So. What does he say? Accept the one whose faith is weak, right? Why should we accept the one, you know, who has a different practice? Because God has accepted them, right? So he says we should accept because God himself has accepted. And how has God accepted them? God's acceptance is based in Jesus Christ, not on what they do or don't do. You see, eating meat or eating vegetables or which day to keep holy or dedicate to God is not a moral matter. It is not a matter that decides your standing with God. That is what Paul is trying to say. But unfortunately, what is happening is or what happened was they made it into a moral matter. They made it into a moral issue. How did they make that into a moral issue? the way they started treating one another by judging them, by finding fault with them, by maybe trying to call names, call them names. You see, they were making a non-issue into a relational issue. And I use that word, del word deliberately, relational issue. You see, when it becomes a relational issue, it has become a serious matter. It has become a moral issue then. 
it was no not a moral issue until then until they made it a relational issue where they were basing their relationship on these disputable matters and that's the reason why the apostle says you know we are creating division by create by 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 putting stumbling blocks before people we are forgetting that we are all brothers and sisters in jesus christ which is far more important than the food we eat or the days we keep or the days we worship on so uh what about what about this what does paul say about this in verse 3 once again let me complete that verse he says uh he says the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does for god has accepted them okay so what is he saying he's saying stop treating others with contempt we must not judge uh, based on these disputable matters and it goes both ways the one who indulges in such an attitude or a, a practice and the one who doesn't both are warned not to indulge in these kinds of judgmental attitudes we should not be losing respect for one another just because on these matters you see because why once again god looks at things according to our intention more than the actual practice god is looking at what we do and of course the intentions behind what we do and he honors that and we should do the same and hence he is very strongly advocating that we do not place a stumbling block before other people now much more can be said about all of this because the entire chapter deals with this but i want to leave you with three points as we um, proceed with the sermon so that we don't fall into the ditch of condemnation you see we must not resort to uh, these kinds of attitudes in the church so where we begin to create division and that is something that the apostle paul feels very strongly about and so the apostle paul in verse 19 he says let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification there it is on the screen verse 19 he says we must do everything to promote peace and of course uh, everything that leads to mutual edification how do we do this as i said i'm going to give you leave you with three points to think about as we uh, understand how do we promote peace and mutual edification in the church the first thing is this learn to distinguish distinguish between essentials and non essentials we have said this many a times before but i feel it 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 requires repeating so that we are constantly learning and so uh, let us be careful what are the core beliefs of the christian faith what are not necessarily the core beliefs what are the peripherals like we would say and we must learn to distinguish them that is how we can become stronger in the faith and of course not resort to unnecessarily creating division by discussing disputable matters because when the apostle space apostle paul says there are disputable matters he means to say there are certain things which are not as important right so there are some core beliefs right very interestingly enough i i i mentioned to you that why do we have disputable matters because the bible is not necessarily very clear about it the bible has not gone on to explain certain things and has left some ambiguity and one theologian put it very interestingly and let me give you that quotation and the quotation is actually attributed to john calvin i think it is and he says the following where god has closed his mouth we learn not to open ours okay in other words if god has not given us more information if god has not spoken about that matter you know uh more clearly let us not be so worried about trying to read into what god has not given to, you know us to understand where the bible is silent we must also learn to be silent 
And this is a very important thing. And uh, Philip Schaff, who is a 19th century historian, he said, uh, referring, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, no, this, this, is, uh, this is to the next quotation. I think you know the next quotation. Uh, let me just put that on. Notice it says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity, again, uh, attributed to Augustine, the church father. And uh, this is once again telling us that in some essential beliefs, the core beliefs, we must have unity, obviously. But there are some non-essentials which we need to give liberty. We need to allow the freedom for people to have their own understanding about that. But in everything, in all our actions and behaviors, we must act with charity, with love. And Philip Schaff, I was just referring to him a little earlier. Philip Schaff, the 19th century historian, calls this particular uh, quotation from Augustine. He says, the watchword of Christian peacemakers, the watchword of Christian peacemakers. In other words, when we understand this and follow it, we are being peacemakers instead of being troublemakers. And we shouldn't be troublemakers. It's very interesting that uh, recently we, in our Bible study, we had a discussion on baptism. And specifically, we had a discussion on child baptism. Uh, some of you who attended that, uh, uh, those sessions, you will remember. And, you know, child baptism is once again one of those issues that does not seem to have certainty in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say yes or no to it. And so we are left with a certain ambiguity. How do we decide? And I am very proud to say that the way we discussed it and the way some of you brought your thoughts and the way you allowed a sense of freedom for us to believe was very good, was very mature. And I feel that we were pursuing uh, that every effort, we are making every effort to lead that leads to peace. And uh, I am very proud that we were dis we discussed that with a, with a tremendous amount of maturity, and we did not try to, you know, find fault with each other. Okay, so what we need to understand is that we are all equal in righteousness, not because of what we do or don't do. Our righteousness is because of Jesus Christ. What we do don't do is not what contributes to our righteousness. Because if there is anything of our own in terms of righteousness, you will remember what Isaiah said, the prophet Isaiah. He said they are nothing more than filthy rags. Let me go to the second point. The second point and how we can lead to peace and mutual edification is a verse from Romans 14 where it says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. And he goes on to say, instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. All right. So uh, the, the critical thing is don't immediately resort to passing judgment. You know, sometimes we Christians, we seem to have a preset default system. I'm using computer language here. I hope all of us can understand. We seem to have a default system. The first reaction when we see some differences is find fault. You know, uh, we, without even thinking, without even giving a moment's, you know, uh, a benefit of doubt, we tend to find fault. You know, we will say, ah, deka, deka, you know, kya kar rahe ho? And we tend to find fault. If you want me to speak uh, Telugu, Maybe we will say, choose now, huh? choose now, you know, immediately we, we start finding fault. That is, seems to be the default system. So my advice is change the default system, because if you're constantly finding default system, uh, we are not doing what Christians must do. And Mother Teresa has a very interesting statement where she says, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. You see, we, our job is to love people. But if you are constantly judging them, we have no time to love them. And so, uh, you know, change the default system. Go to 
uh, uh, go to manual, <laughs> if I could say, you know, and disable the automatic setting of, of constantly finding fault and judging. You know, Jesus was very, very strong on this. You remember he said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, do not judge others and you will, uh, and you will not be judged. In other words, uh, he says, you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. So Jesus was very strong on this judgmental attitude because if that is the way we are going to treat people, then Jesus says, uh, be ready to be treated that way. And we don't want to be treated that way, right? We, we should ask ourselves, do we, be, do we want to be judged the same way we judge others? Hope not. And so we, we of course, now, that doesn't mean to say that you suspend all judgment. You know, Jesus himself says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Yes, it is necessary to be vigilant for falsehood, for false theologies, and for uh, wrong practices. But getting into a habit of judgment is bad and negative. So we have to be careful that we are constantly not questioning the devotion of other people to God just because they do something differently. Because God, if God accepts it and God is able to make them stand, we don't have to be so negative and critical about other people. And finally, my third point uh, is uh, simply the word accept, right? That is how the chapter begins, accept, right? After understanding that there are essentials, not essentials, you know, in the Christian faith and our belief system, after understanding that we have to resist the temptation to judge, let us go one step more further. Let us go another step, and that is to accept. Why? Because it's only in acceptance we can experience harmony. You do not experience harmony in constantly a critical, judgmental attitude. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in verse 19. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. How do we do that? It is only through an attitude of acceptance, not through an attitude where we look down on people just because of a certain practice that they might have. So accepting means you accept a sense of diversity. We accept a uniqueness that each one brings to our fellowship. And who is the one who's made those differences? It is God himself. God has made us unique with our own characteristics, but we bring it to the mutual edification of all, right? And in one sense, by accepting others, you're actually accepting yourself. You see, you're actually affirming yourself because acceptance is a manifestation of love. What Paul says again in verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, no, no, no longer acting in love. The Apostle Paul is very strong about the need for us to always manifest our, you know, uh, what you say, our behavior on the foundation of love. Love should be the foundational motiv motivation of our behavior. Right. So accept one another. Right. Especially when it comes to disputable matters. Right. If you are struggling with what could they could be, then always take counsel. There are people to help you with that. I want to end by a story. Uh, even as we move to taking the communion, the story is about my own brother. Some of you know him. Uh, he is much older to me. But he told me something which stuck in my mind and I felt it fits very well here. I remember he telling me about how when he went to uh, do his uh, master's program in engineering, he had gone to Karakpur, IIT Karakpur. That's where he got his master's from. And uh, it was in those good old days when we used to be very strong about the Sabbath keeping. And he found out that his final exam, one of the exams fell on a Saturday. And he was very upset because 
we had taught that you cannot write exams on a Saturday because it's a Sabbath day. And so he was very, very distraught because of that. He decided to tell his professor, uh, a, a professor from a different faith, I think he was from the Hindu faith, and he told the professor, see, this is my belief. I cannot write the exam on a Saturday. Uh, is there something you can do to help me? Of course, the professor was absolutely surprised. He says, what? I mean, are you going to give up an exam because it falls on a Saturday? He couldn't understand the, the rationale behind keeping one particular day holy and thinking that you can't even write an exam. So he had absolutely no respect for whatever his belief system was. But interestingly enough, that professor respected my brother. And he went to the extent of even to, the, uh, to his own harm or you know, to his own risk, he allowed him to write the exam on a Friday in his private chambers without anybody knowing. And he allowed him to finish his exam and then let him go on to do and whatever he wanted to do on a Saturday. And I thought to myself, as I think about that, uh, that incident, I thought to myself, if a man of a different faith, if a man who does not even know Christ can treat others with so much respect, even though you don't, he doesn't, doesn't accept his belief system, if he can treat a man with such respect, how much more should we? How much more should we who know Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ who respects us and accepts us and gives his life for us to each one of us. How much more should we be slow in judging others? And so, brethren, as I leave you with those thoughts, I'd like to lead you in the communion. And as I lead you in the communion, I'd like to read this one scripture in the same chapter of Romans 14 where the apostle tells us, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong, we belong to the Lord for this reason, for this very reason Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Brethren, as we take the communion today, I would like you to consider the scripture. You see, the scripture is telling us that Christ's Lordship is supreme. It is all inclusive. In every experience, we belong to the Lord, our Lord Jesus. And Christ is Lord of all. You know, whether we like it or not, Christ is the Lord of all. But why is he the Lord of all? Not only because of his great sacrifice for us, but because of the fact that he has included and accepted all of us, all of humanity in his death and resurrection. Jesus Christ respects every living human being on the face of the earth. Whether you come from this faith or that faith, Christ respects his respect is so much that he would die for each and every one who may not probably even know him while we were still in our sin. So let us be motivated to accept all for Christ's sake. Join me as I pray for the elements. You may take your elements at this time. Keep your bread and wine ready. And uh, let me pray for the bread and wine. And then we will partake together. Gracious, loving Father, thank you so much once again for bringing us together and gathering us around your table, of course, in a virtual way because we are not together physically. We thank you for reminding us, Father, that in your, in your death, you have included all of humanity. You have so much love and respect that you have redeemed everyone 
in your shed blood, in your sacrifice. And so give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the maturity to be able to accept one another so that we don't create those divisions which are not from Christ so that we can bring mutual edification for each one of us and for all of us in the fellowship of the church. And so gracious Lord, as we partake in the bread and wine, we express and we accept your Lordship over us. We thank you for including us in your redeeming grace. And we submit ourselves to your Lordship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may take your bread at this time and let us eat, for this is the body of Christ broken to heal and redeem us. Please take your wine, drink, for this is the blood of Christ shed for the cleansing of our sins. And let us now live, live to proclaim the love of God, even as we love one another. God bless you.